Hi, it's Joe Partavilla. Welcome back to the Forbes Books Podcast. And I saw an article the other day titled something like 10 Simple Ways to Build a $10 Million Business. Now, if you're an entrepreneur, you know there's no simple way of building a business. But we do all know that its success rests on your shoulders and the people you surround yourself with. This week, I'm joined by Jason Randall. Jason is the CEO of Questco, a Houston area HR outsourcing company. He's also the author of the forthcoming book, Beyond the Superhero, Executive Leadership for the Rest of Us. Hey, Jason. Hey, Joe. Good morning. Good morning. And, you know, I want to start with this. HR, it seems like as an outsider, that industry has changed a lot over the last 20 years. Tell us what, what the scope of HR is these days. Well, I'm not sure I'm the best prepared to answer you know, across the disciplines, right? Because I'm, I'm actually not the practitioners. We rely on teams for that. But what I would say is uh, the, the nature of your question is a great one because HR is ultimately handling the, the people of an organization. And that is endlessly complicated anyway, and has only gotten more so when you consider things like what must we do for the people that work for us, providing benefits, uh, providing a, a quality of life and an employee experience, um, doing things that, that make their lives easier and more productive and ultimately more fulfilling and, and happy. And that's no easy task. And with, with the overwhelming trend toward more regulation, more things that, that go on in the workplace that we have to be sensitive uh, about and cater to, that just adds to the de degree of difficulty that a business has to contend with when they're talking about the, the human resources of their organization. Hmm. And let's talk about Questco before we move on. So your HR outsourcing company, which if I'm not mistaken, it's there's an acronym for it, right? Isn't it like a P P O E or P E O? What is what's what's that acronym? I'm You're on the right track. It's it's P E O. And, and okay. obviously there are many ways to categorize the universe of outsourced HR from very tactical point solutions all the way through more comprehensive models, such as the ones we provide under something that's called a professional employer organization. That's the PEO structure. one, right? Yes. All right. Exactly. Good, good, good. good. And so, uh, so for folks not familiar, break that down for us. So in a nutshell, it's ultimately a, a, a tantalizingly simple concept of shared employment to where you can partner with an organization like ours and your employees become our employees of record and that enables you to join something larger. And again, by you, you're, you're operating a small, a mid-sized business, but you might wanna benefit from the skill and scale of a larger provider and really help supercharge your own team. So join with us, you can access our large company benefits, our large company workers' compensation programs, large company 401k. And then also our resources, which are very tenured, very skilled. So you're getting both access to product that you may not have available as easily, and also people that can help you move the business forward. That's what's special about the model. And that you can do it all with the stroke of a pen. Makes it really easy for that business owner to really move some major things off their plate and have it handled best in class uh, very quickly. Hmm. And who are these companies that use PEOs generally? Is there a industry that utilizes them more than others, or is it sort of like run the gamut? Well, the beautiful thing is all businesses work through their people, right? Many would say things like our people are our greatest asset and so on. So this concept of a better way to manage people and handle the needs of, of the people that work for an organization, that's across industries, right? So there's broad applicability in terms of who, who can connect with this concept. The concept, by the way it's structured, is more relevant and resonant uh, from, say, uh, 10 employees up to a couple hundred employees. And then outside of that situation, you'll, you'll find special uh, sort of situations where larger and smaller companies can benefit as well. Hmm. And so talk to me about your journey to Questco, because, you know, like we, we mentioned at the beginning, you know, HR is a very complicated space. How did you find yourself working for in this kind of field? Well, so not to give the uh, full resume background, Joe, but <laughs> I was introduced to this concept actually as a small business operator. Um, I was I was hired actually by my younger brother to manage a fast growing company that he and his wife had built, and it was growing incredibly quickly. Uh, at the time, it was the Inc. 500 list, and the company was near the top of the Inc. 500 list. I was hired to come on and really professionalize the organization for growth and sale. And part of it, when we looked at what that entailed, part of that was really having a more robust response to HR that would enable us to compete. And this business was in Austin. We could compete more aggressively and more compellingly for talent with the likes of the University of Texas and Dell and Google and these, these sort of flashy tech employers. Well, they, they offered wonderful things to their people. We needed to do the same 
just to get the talent that we needed to thrive. And so that led us to this PEO model. I used to stand up in front of groups of, of salespeople in the industry and say, hey, look, people like you literally changed my life. Because what you enabled is for us to have this entire area handled expertly so that we can go and execute our business plan successfully. And so that's what led me to awareness of the industry as it, and as you can tell, I was a big evangelist uh, behind the concept as a business operator, so much so that when that business exited, I was actually recruited by a PEO to do exactly that, to evangelize for the space and so on. And that led me uh, indirectly to my role at Questco, where I have the chance to build the entirety of a, a wonderful uh, PEO organization, outsourced HR organization. Uh, you know, Jason, I don't know about you, but I love what ifs. Like, what if your brother didn't hire you to run that company? You would never have known, you probably wouldn't have known what a PEO was. And now all of a sudden you're like this, the, you know, the leader in your field in this. Isn't it crazy? It is, right? You know, the whole sliding doors principle of, of uh, leadership in life, right? Yeah, I'm sure something else would have come along, but I'm sure glad that the doors uh, opened in this way and I was exposed to the concept. And so talk to me about your love of leadership or, or interest in it, because you wrote the book uh, Beyond the Superhero Executive Leadership for the Rest of Us. Uh, talk to me about leadership. What, what does that mean to you? Well, sure. And, and, and the, the book and really the, the, this talk is not so much about HR, only sort of peripherally that, that brings us to the table. But one of my passions has been supporting others and their, their journeys, among them a leadership journey. And one of the things I, I saw is as a, as a newer executive at several points in my career, different roles, I wish I would have had a, a, a big brother, a, a more comprehensive mentorship, things that would, would help me uh, feel like I wasn't alone in the challenges of being a new leader, right? There's so many things that people might either assume you know or assume you're comfortable with, and you may be having to render an opinion on something five seconds after you're first introduced to the concept. And that's a really challenging place to be. And there's this, there's this sort of thing that's built up in many of us that, well, we just have to know it all just by osmosis, by magic, you should know it. And of course, you know, I, I'm sure you could agree, Joe, that the truth is so much more challenging than that. So the, the, the aspect of leadership that I want to support is, is the notion of providing a family, a sounding board, other perspectives to really help, especially newer executives that might be stepping into a senior role for the first time. Maybe someone inherited a family business. Maybe they were promoted through a more traditional organization. But either way, they found themselves in charge of significant assets, significant people, and making significant decisions. How do we help them do that? Yeah. And you know, it's funny about being a leader and being a CEO. There's no like, there is no CEO school. As much as, you know, you have these Harvard and Yales and these Ivy Leagues that, uh, pretend to be, you know, uh, bastions of leadership. There's not like a class where you take how to be a CEO or how to be a good CEO, I guess would be a better class. So why do you think in terms of leadership, and there's so many books about leadership and people talking about leadership, why do you think there isn't a way for people to learn as they're doing it or a place to go to learn how to do it while they're in the middle of it? Because like I said, there's no place you could just be like, hey, now I'm a CEO. Now I know everything. I guess my answer to that is that there are many fantastic resources to go and get part of the picture, right? You, you can learn the technical skills, you can learn, uh, you know, the, the executive operating system or something similar to walk you through the behaviors that might make a difference. There are ways to, to handle the emotional elements of it as well. I, I think the, the challenge is it's general management. And so a lot of things come at you. And so what you need is not only the technical skills, but also a mindset, a flexibility, and a humanity that's kind of hard to learn other than by doing. So I think it takes all of it, Joe. I think you have to have some, some literal skills training, and that's immensely helpful. But the germ of the question is so wonderful because, yeah, it's hard to get it all, right? And especially when you're newer to a role, there's a lot that comes at you that is not all that classroom. You might not have studied it in the classroom. They might not have taught you the, the very human factors of, uh, you know, on paper it might say one thing, but... You know, you, you may have a, a valued team member that has some really special short term needs that you need to address. It's hard to know how to do that. And that's, I guess, more broadly called, in fewer words, judgment, right? How do you develop and refine your judgment over time? And that's really what we're talking about. And uh, let's talk about you in terms of your leadership journey. I mean, I don't know if you have an anecdote to share, maybe something from the book, but was there a moment in your early days as a CEO where you're like, man, I wish someone told me this was going to happen? Oh, it happens all the time. I think it still happens, you know, yeah. multiple times a week where, boy, I wish I, I would be more prepared emotionally or otherwise for this. I, I would say one that I, there, there's a there's a 
period of time that I discussed in the book when I assumed my current role uh, in a couple of months in where, um, you know, I think one of the things around becoming a new executive and particularly a CEO specifically is that you know, overnight, all your jokes are funny. All your points are valid, right? You, there is nobody to tell you that you're not awesome. They may say it very differently behind your back, but to your face, you don't get real time feedback about how you're doing or how things are going and so on. And just a couple months into my tenure here at Quesco, we had a moment where there was a team that, uh, and, and it, so it basically an entire small department walked on the same day. And it wasn't really a statement about me. It wasn't about me at all. It was more just people that were tired of, you know, there have been a couple of corporate transitions all in a short period of time. They were just sort of collectively and individually ready to do something else. So, you know, the question that I'm answering here is, well, how do you deal with a situation where an entire department walks out the same two days? It's not really because of you, but it sure is for you to deal with, at least primarily deal with. What do you do about that? Do you mm -hmm. convince them to try to stay? Um, how do you deal with the aftermath? What about the communication to the rest of the organization? How do you display that, uh, you know, you really, we, we have things under control, even though there are people voting with their feet. These are not easily... Uh, glibly uh, described solutions. You really have to get in there and uh, again embrace the totality of the situation. Yeah. And, and, and in my case, you know, it's just about being uh, candid and honest, saying, you know, hey, th this is what's happened, and we wish these people well, and we're going to be just fine. Hmm. I may not know exactly how, but we're going to be just fine. Uh, you know, it's funny. I worked in radio for many years, and my uh, the guy I did a show with. Uh, we would always joke that the the general manager of the station, I guess, for lack of a better word, the president of the, of the station. Uh, always put his two cents in about everything, whether it's you know, the marketing, whether it's about programming. And uh, the guy I worked with always used to say, he goes, whoever sits in the co corner office always feels like they're an expert on everything. Not all of them, obviously, but there is this, this sort of like aura that once you've gotten into this office, even though you may not have training in these other sort of sec sectors, you feel like you n need now to add input to whatever you feel like you can. So like you said, there's the, the leaders who like don't know what they're doing and they're learning as they go, but then there's this other side of it, the, uh, the other side of the coin where they're like, okay, now I'm the CEO, I know everything. I guess my question here is like, how do you find that sort of happy medium where you are learning and growing, but at the same time have the confidence to add input on things you may not be an expert in? First of all, great question, because this is something that confronts every leader of, of any magnitude, right? Is that suddenly by virtue of your title, you're, you're deemed uh, responsible for, for consequential decisions about something. Um, a central point that we make in the book and that I live my life by every day is you cannot do it all. Uh, the, the, the title of Beyond the Superhero is meant to convey that um, very similar to the way that uh, Photoshop and airbrushing have, have made our body images weird when we look at magazine covers. Mm -hmm. So too, do we feel a little weird as leaders not knowing the answers to everything? That we, we should have that. We, we are, by virtue of these titles, suddenly we should become the, the owner of all, all knowledge and the maker of all decisions. But the path to success generally doesn't follow that way. And it, it, it I believe it's an essential skill is to develop the, the ability to not only trust others, but to rely on others to help us make those decisions collectively and optimally. So um, in my case, individual case, a lot of this has been born out of necessity. You know, the company I mentioned with my brother, that was a fast growing e-commerce company. I didn't know how to program, so I could spend the rest of my year trying to come up with the optimal programming solution to a challenge. That's not going to get us there. Likewise, in my current role, I can't run a payroll. I'm not licensed to give benefits advice. I don't know our technical systems well enough to program them or optimize them for a client. So that forces a certain, a certain humility that, you know what, I have some, a lot to bring to the party when it comes to helping people realize their potential, talking through issues, getting uh, resources allocated appropriately and doing these sorts of things. But I can't do it all. I don't know it all. And I think it's liberating just to step away from that and say, hey, I, I don't know this, but I, I do know how to help you realize the best decision. Let's work through together and get to the right place. And that's such an important thing for new leaders to acknowledge, because to your point, Joe, if you think that you have to know it all, eventually your team will just let you make all the decisions and they'll be as, as good as your limited knowledge will take you. And it's unambiguously not as good as if we would have let them in on that decision. I feel like, you know, one of the things that make great leaders, and I'm sure this has been written about uh, ad nauseum, is the fact that, you know, surrounding yourself with good people. If you see, like, the Bob Igers of the world, 
he didn't explode Disney with taking over that mess that he had taken over when he did back in the day because he was Bob Iger. It's because he had the right people in place around him to elevate things. And then he was the one who made the big decisions in terms of like, all right, I'm going to buy Star Wars. I'm going to buy Marvel. When it came to the grand scope ideas, he he took charge of that. But when it came to the execution, he wasn't going to tell Marvel how to make a Spider-Man movie. You know what I mean? So uh, is that how you see, like, in terms of your leadership skills, like just making sure you got the right people with you? The example you gave is awesome, right? Because it, it says, yes, Bob Iger can make some great decisions about what assets to buy, how to align the company, take a vision and take a bold step forward. But he's not trying to write the script of Avengers Endgame, right? right. He, he, is, he is trying to put things into a coherent whole that makes sense. And when you have that skill to where the, the people in your organization are trusted and capable and empowered, you're going to do some fantastic things. Conversely, if you hold that all back and nope, I got to write the script, I got to make sure that uh, Tony Stark's in my hands only, you're going to have some problems. Yeah. And you know, one thing that's weird for me, Jason, I'm a Gen Xer. So the deification of CEOs and founders has been very weird. And I think it, for me, I think it started with jobs. But like all of a sudden, when you become a founder or CEO of a company, you have this sort of like godlike aura, you know, whether it's the Elon Musks of the world right now. Do you find that weird that all of a sudden, because, you know, we're talking about how funny it is that these, these are just regular people who get thrust into these roles. Uh, you know, they may have created something on their own, but the fact that they are deified and that they're gods in this position. How strange is that to you? I think it's tremendously unfortunate, right? Because I think it, it necessarily denigrates the contributions of the teams that enable those celebrity leaders to succeed. And, you know, I, it is not in any way to put down uh, exceptional visionaries and and outstanding performance, whether it's the examples you name or many others. But we shouldn't be able to name a huge company and think that one person that we can visualize and know who that is, is solely responsible for the success of that. Because what that ultimately means is, well, you're you're not built to last as a company. You're, you're only as good as the caprices and whims and judgment of one person. What a weight to carry. And if you're a shareholder, if you're, if you're a stakeholder, what a terrible place to be if it's just one person that's responsible for all of this. Yeah. It's funny. I was just thinking while you were saying that, it was about, about the Steve Jobs movie. And I think there was a scene with Jobs and Wozniak. And Wozniak said to Steve Jobs, like, what do you do? Like, you you don't build computers. You don't write code. What is exactly is it that you do? And, you know, Steve Jobs, basically, he was he was that thing, that visionary. He was the one, like, he had this idea, but he had no idea <laughs> <laughs> how to put 10,000 songs on a little device or how to uh, have people buy music. He, he, But he found a way to motivate people to get his job done. But it, and that's a great example of what you say, Jason, is the fact that, you know, as much as Jobs is associated with Apple, Apple's still Apple. They may not be innovating as much as they did years ago, but the fact that they have remained this sort of <laughs> this this monster in the world of technology and these trillion dollar valuations and all that stuff. It just goes to show you that it's more than just the man. And I, I think most business leaders readily accept that. And the reason we know they readily accept that is that they put their money where their mouth is here. If you truly believe that it's just up to you uh, to succeed, then you're not going to invest in your people. You're going to have you know whomever on your on your team. If it's all up to you, you don't need to have benefits programs. You don't need to have much of anything other than uh, you know a paycheck and a temperate place to work. Because otherwise, it's just. It's just irrelevant because you're the you're the sole genius that can drive this forward. And of course, what we see in the marketplace is very different. And certainly, what I I see in our, our small and mid sized business communities is, is strikingly different. Where uh, whether the, the organization is, is a household name or not, leaders recognize. Well, no, I, I need a good team. I need to provide an experience that allows allows me to build something special. I can't do that by myself. This is out there, right? Because we, we see the investment in people and, and people struggling with that across sizes and industries and locations. But there's still this sort of, you know, magazine-like uh, weirdness, as you, as you said, Joe, in the Gen X context that, hey, I, I better be Lee, Lee Iacocca if I want to run this company. <laughs> right. Uh, and, you know, we were mentioned a few leaders off, uh, here, but do you have like one or two that you're like, wow, this is a leader that I... Maybe not exactly emulate, but there are things I take away from the way they've operated or, or the things they've accomplished. 
I'm not sure there's one that's dominant in terms of my thinking because I like to kind of salad bar this thing and take a, a little bit of insight and genius from all over the place. And I guess my mind is just a my mind is just a series of memes uh, <laughs> running through it in, in some ways. But what I would say is. It's always been key to me to to value people. So there are thought leaders like Simon Sinek, who's just been incredibly influential to my thinking. Sean Acor, in terms of positivity, that's been very influential to my thinking. And then I think I've been fortunate to be exposed to all kinds of leaders. Um, uh, you know, in my many, I'm a Gen Xer too, so way too many years in business at this point to kind of get us to um, okay. What can I synthesize and make uniquely mine and thus ours uh, to go forward? So I think it's a little bit of literally hundreds of contributors that have, that have sort of shaped my philosophy. Cool. And I want to circle back to Beyond the Superhero. And one of the things you write about is clarifying purpose. And I think if anyone's, you know, read about, you know, successful businesses all about, you know, the CEO or the visionary founder had created a purpose for the company. And I think, you know, most entrepreneurs, as you know, is find a problem, solve a problem, then you make money. But it's not as simple as that anymore, right? There's, a, there's got to be more to that purpose, right? Uh, well, certainly a lot, of, a lot of employees and particularly newer hires coming up, they, they are not as interested uh, as a role in just the, the, the paycheck and even the, what's in it for them. They want to know what's in it for us. The, the, am I making a difference in the world? And so the purpose of the organization, you at least need to be familiar with these factors, and what good are you doing? Um, you know, something that I challenge our, our team at every uh, group gathering is, you know, hey, there, there are, say, 900-ish companies that do what we do, in, just in the United States. Why should anybody care that we exist, right? What, you know, if, if we just disappeared, our clients could get absorbed, and would they be just fine in, in two months? And if you can't answer that question convincingly, that no, no, we're, we're approaching this in a way that they'd miss us, and, and we deserve to exist, and in fact, we should be thriving. What a, what a great place to be, not only because you're un, unambiguously articulating a higher value to your clientele and your potential clientele, but you're giving an internal rallying cry to your people. And that in turn enables them to say, no, I am a part of something larger to myself than, than myself. And that is one of the most powerful things for a human being to experience is, you know what, I'm a part of something doing good in the world that's bigger than me. I want to be a part of this. Hmm. And I want to get into vulnerability. Uh, I'm sure you saw Brene Brown years ago had that TED Talk about the power of vulnerability. And I think you've seen that over the past year with a lot of CEOs um, that are really front-facing. And whether it's discussing social issues or the pandemic, showing uh, levels of vulnerability. Uh, talk to me about you as a leader in terms of showing that. Because, you know, as we mentioned, we're both Gen Xers. So I think we, as a kid, we would envision an old white guy who's balding with a suit, uh, being tough as nails as, you know, the leader of a company. But that's completely different now. I mean, there's still old white guys running companies, don't get me wrong. But it is different in terms of like the presentation of these leaders, right? Yeah. I mean, first of all, diversity is a wonderful thing in all of its forms, you know, whether we're talking about ethnic background, race, uh, diversity of thought as well. And of course, gender. So obviously, the more we can do deal away with the old white guy and and have a more broad based leadership, I think that's a that's a good thing for our society. Um, and, but beyond that, regardless of who you are, including if you're an old white guy, I think what employees and stakeholders expect is authenticity. And and the way it always strikes me, Joe, is if you see somebody that's, you know what, everything's always great, or or basically um, holding everything close to the vest, you're lacking authenticity. And one of the ways that you, you should be authentic is in your humanity. And then in turn, part of being human is being vulnerable. I don't always have the answer. Wow, this is a big thing. Let's get through it together. Just showing one's humanity gets you so far with people. And then ultimately what it's about is they in turn will, give, will, will feel comfortable being authentic themselves telling you when they're having a bad day or if they're struggling with things that are you know, going on at home outside of the workplace. Because I think what, what you're hitting on is through vulnerability, we can enhance our empathy and then we can care more about our people, the, the total person that, that uh, comes to work for our organization. They make that decision every day to, to get up and come in and uh, or work virtually as, as the zeitgeist might have it now. Bottom line is when you can be vulnerable, you're being authentic. And by being authentic, you can be relatable you can be productive, and you can be fabulously successful. It's funny. You, you mentioned a three-word phrase that I was going to bring up. It's, I don't know. 
I remember when saying I don't know was like the worst thing in the world, like the old fake it till you make it thing, you know, come up with an answer, come up with a solution. But it is refreshing now that those words are acceptable. Like, it's okay to say, I don't know. I don't have the answer to this. That's, in a way, a great shift in the way business and, and actually life has gone these last few years, right? Oh, sure. Sure. And there are limits to this too, right? If you show up to your team and you just never know the answer, (laughs) that's going to be uh, very challenging for you longer term. Right. And if you always know the answer, well, they'll just shut down and stop thinking. I think what's so refreshing about the prevailing management style that seems to be winning today is that you can, as a leader, say, I don't know. And I know, I believe in you that you know or if you don't know, we will figure this out together. What an awesome place to be, to build a team around that kind of concept that no matter what throws at us, no matter how unknown, unfamiliar, scary it might be, a lot less scary when we tackle it together as a team. Hmm. So we can say, I don't know. I think it's an awesome thing. Yeah, you're right. You could say it, but don't use it all the time because otherwise they'll be like, so what are you sitting there if you don't know? <laughs> if you don't know all this. Uh, Should we get somebody in here that knows something? Right. Yeah. Can we, do, can we put someone else in this corner office? Uh, you know, it's funny because, you know, you're obviously well-read and and obviously knowledgeable about leadership. And, you know, I'm sh- this happens to me too, but since you know so much about leadership, do you ever catch yourself when you're in, in your leadership role, like you have like an out-of-body experience where you're like, oh, no, I should know better. I shouldn't have done that thing. I shouldn't have said that. Why did I do that? Do you ever catch yourself doing that? Oh my gosh, all the time. I, don't you, right? No, of course. <laughs> That's why I mean, like, I always try to give people advice on, like, how to do podcasts and how to be a good listener. And then all of a sudden, I'll fall into the trap of doing everything I said not to do. So I was just wondering, like, in terms of, like, when you catch yourself, are you able to uh, sort of right the ship immediately? Or is that one of those things where, like, the next day, you're like, ah, oh, man, I got to fix this? Well, it depends how self aware I am yeah. in the moment. <laughs> I think this kind of relates to a concept that it's, for me is just so important. I, I believe strongly you can't be one sort of person at home and a different kind of person at the office. You are who you are. And then you can, you know, there might be versions of yourself that you choose to emphasize. But for me, I, I like to emphasize humor in the workplace and self, self-reflection, self self-deprecation goes a long way, honestly. So if, if I'm flaking out, not, not being true to who I am in the moment or whatever else, you know what? Let, let's let's show some humility. Eat some humble pie. Uh, make a joke about it, and let's just get back on track. And and people don't expect again to your point, earlier point. They don't expect perfection. They expect humanity and competence. And we can provide that, even if we're not always one hundred percent of the time our best selves. I, I guess we should touch upon the pandemic here. You know, you were running a business in the middle of the pandemic, so. What did you see in terms of the the shifts or, you know, obviously you work from home, but like what did you see are some of the big shifts in terms of maybe team purpose, uh, team goals, the culture of the company? How did you, what kind of shifts did you see from, you know, March 2020 to March 2021? So it's a, a question that has a lot of layers to answer by virtue of the business that we are in of supporting other people's organizations, because so many of the issues that are inherent in the pandemic involve how do I deal with my people? How do I keep them safe? How do I keep them productive? How do I manage everything from morale to productivity in an environment that's unfamiliar? If I can't go remote, what does that mean? If I can, what does that mean? And so this is our clientele of you know hundreds and hundreds of clients facing these issues. And then we at, at, at the Quesco organization have to be resourced to be there for them at this time of need. And then you layer in the massive complexity involved with the government intervention in terms of support programs like the PPP loan program, some tax credits that were available. So fundamentally, I'm giving a couple of examples to illustrate that overnight, we had to be an organization that was provisioned and ready to help our clients through their own existential challenges, even as we were dealing with our own. And that's a degree of difficulty that thankfully we to, to the, what we've been talking about all, all hour. We had the team in place to work through these unfamiliar decisions because, you know, shockingly, Joe, I hadn't done a lot of game planning on what happens if there's a world, if there's a, a, a pandemic that uh, shuts down. You failed physical. as a leader, Jason. Jeez. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so again, take off the superhero cape, put on the visor and glasses and get to work about how do we solve these things together. So what we saw in the pandemic is, first of all, I don't really get the impression from a lot of the news headlines I've been reading for a year. I don't recognize a lot of the business community that's portrayed through these articles because the business community that I know 
Uh, th these are people that are heavily invested in their teams. They care about them immensely. They want them to be safe. They want them to, to be happy, right? And so the question that we got most often from our clientele, you know, is first of all, how do I keep the doors open mm. depending on the industry and the situation? But secondly, how do I make sure my people are okay through this? And it, it, this pandemic has created all kinds of challenges in every sort of way. And certainly as we sit here toward the, the end of it, it's so nice that there's light at the end of the tunnel because we've had to deal with all kinds of human issues around how do we interact productively when suddenly most of our interaction, our interaction is virtual? Hmm. Or how do I have, how do I keep my restaurant solvent in the face of a lot of shutdown restrictions and, and safety concerns and things like that? So everybody brings their own sort of challenge to it. What I would say is certainly it's something that uh, has often showed us, I think, the best in us that I think it's swept away with sort of the, the, the news coverage that what we have ultimately are millions of people operating small businesses that are trying to do the right thing for them and their people. And it's just our honor to help them through that because we just can't argue with the fact that the pandemic has had far reaching effects for basically every single business, every single person in this country. I know I get, I get a little weird, right? Uh, I, I don't have nearly the amount of social interaction face to face that I've had, uh, you know, in my entire career before that. So I, I don't always know how to make eye contact or finish a sentence or things <laughs> like that. Uh, so we have to relearn a lot of these skills too. Well, his name is Jason Randall. He is the CEO of Questco, a Houston area HR outsourcing company and the author of the upcoming book, Beyond the Superhero, Executive Leadership for the Rest of Us. Jason, this has been a great chat. Thanks so much for the time. Thank you, Joe. You are very welcome. And that's it for this edition of the Forbes Books Podcast. If you enjoy the show, Make sure you take a second to subscribe so you automatically get new shows when they drop. And also, if you have a minute, I'd love if you left us a review so more entrepreneurs like yourself can discover the show. And lastly, please don't forget the golden rule and treat others as you want to be treated. Thanks for listening. Until next time, adios. This has been a production of Forbes Books Radio. Find out more at ForbesBooksRadio.com.